Several girls gossip about the rumors that their school, Shinryu Academy, is built over a massive gravesite. Their dorm mother, Rei, reminds them to go to sleep. As she looks over the brilliant moon, she remarks that a certain someone is protecting the tenuous peace they all have. When the clock strikes midnight, the moon turns red and a massive mausoleum erupts from the ground. At the very top lies a brilliant, shining silver jewel, which becomes the target of innumerable hordes of night creatures. A boy named Sui, accompanied by his pet cat, Wan Choi, defends the mausoleum from the invaders. He swoops down like a raging river, slicing, dicing, and jullying his way through the monsters. With his two flaming swords in hand, he carves a path, all while wishing his service would come to an end. Sui continues to fight through the zombies, though several have amalgamated into larger, towering giants. Surrounded, he unleashes his trump card, the Thousand Graves, causing gigantic headstones to sprout from the ground, toppling and impaling every zombie within his line of sight. Sui is fighting to protect this world and a certain someone. He jumps down to fight the remaining zombies, and his battle begins anew. A year ago, Sui, a penniless high schooler who takes on odd jobs to make ends meet, works as a cleaner at a local pool. When a few bullies toss one toy into the water, Sui, who is unable to swim, fearlessly dives in after him, and he seemingly drowns. However, he awakens a few hours later and learns from his friend, Ran Shao, that he was saved by Rei, the wealthy daughter of a game developer at God Great Tech Company, or the GGTC. When he realized he was saved by mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, he starts wondering about the proper protocol. At night, a young couple starts getting a little too flirty at the local graveyard. They run away when two pairs of red eyes start staring at them, which only turns out to be Sui on the job. Sui returns to the station, which is hooked up to Shinryu Academy's electricity lines. He passes the time by playing an online game called Dungeon Century, where he is famously known as Gin, an enigmatic, silent player who defeats every single boss with the worst imaginable equipment. When he sees a player being chased by a mushroom kickbacker, he rescues her with a single physical attack. The girl introduces herself as Rei, but before he can reply, his power goes out. While trying to fix the electrical wiring, he overhears Rei talking about a mysterious player who helped her, but he is spotted. No amount of explanation could ever save Sui from this situation. The other girl throws a pillow at him, while calling him a pervert. The next day, an injured Sui is cleaning the school windows when he eavesdrops on Rei, who boasts that her father made Dungeon Century. However, as her friend points out, Rei isn't any good at the game, but she enjoys it nonetheless. Rancha notices that Sui has become smitten with Rei, and warns him that trying to woo her will only end in tragedy. Sui convinces himself that all he cares about is getting stronger in Dungeon Century, and nothing else matters. Later, while checking on his character, he suddenly receives a friend request from Rei. Sui accepts her request, and over the next few months, the two go on various adventures together. Rei hopes to meet and get to know the real Sui one day, but because he is far too busy with his part-time work, he laments that they live in completely different worlds. His only dream is that they continue to adventure together forever. However, one evening, Sui is slapped with an end-of-service announcement for Dungeon Century. Sui is devastated by the announcement, which spells the end for both his favorite pastime and his adventures with Rei. Meanwhile, at Rei's house, Rei's father, Yuki, gives her a parcel and instructs her to open it when the time is right. He declares that Dungeon Century's role as a prototype has ended, and his next game is what will truly change the world, which he boasts will be a reality that surpasses reality. He jokingly apologizes for ending the game right when Rei made a new partner, and she is embarrassed that she was being monitored. A depressed Sui loafs around the school fountain. Rancho encourages him to physically approach Rei, while his girlfriend is surprised that Sui's never even talked to Rei in real life. Sui trudges home, and Yuki's car passes by him. That evening, Rei's roommate, Maki, goes to sleep ahead of her, while she logs into Dungeon Century. She overhears other players grumbling about the game ending after spending so much money on it. However, they mention something called an evening song flower, said to be able to grant one in-game wish of the player's desire. When Sui finally logs in, after leaving his part-time job, Rei pulls him along to make the most of their last week together. While adventuring, Rei tells him of her wish to find the evening song flower, said to be hidden in a faraway flower field. Sui offers to help her find it, and she is overjoyed. They frolic underneath an overgrown leaf umbrella, and they laugh as droplets of water splash on their faces. Meanwhile, God Grave Tech Company announced their next upcoming title, Grave Buster, which will have players hunt for treasures hidden in graveyards and tombs. A selling point is that the more you spend money on the game, the stronger you get, which is exactly like any other pay-to-win game. Fortunately, they will freely distribute a custom phone-like console, the Seabay, to anyone who wants to play it. Yuki, 
proud of this mess that only electronic arts could have made, boasts that this is only the beginning. The final day of Dungeon Century arrives, and Sui is filled with a deep-seated sadness. A large parade is held in-game, which will continue until the strike of midnight. Yuki observes the in-game festivities from his office, declining his assistant's suggestion to return home. Meanwhile, a red-haired woman named L infiltrates Yuki's office. L demands to know how to enter the last tomb, but when Yuki refuses, she kills him. Sui, already late for his meetup time with Rei, races back as fast as he can, but his bike breaks down, causing him to fall down a slope. Rei, tired of waiting for Sui, asks the bartender for a favor, and she heads to a beautiful flower field. Soon after, in game, the city is in flames after being attacked by a mysterious individual who kills everyone they come across. Rei realizes it far too late, and she watches in horror as they claim even more victims. Sui runs all the way back to the dorm area and uses every ounce of his strength to run to his computer. Rei does her best to fend off the mysterious attacker, but they prove to be too powerful a foe. Sui finally logs in and receives Rei's message that she has gone ahead to the flower field. When he arrives, he finds her equipment gone, and he cradles her in his arms. She apologizes for not being able to find the evening song flower, but when their tears mix, the seemingly ordinary flower she is holding blooms into the very flower they were searching for. However, Rei is killed by the mysterious enemy, and Sui is powerless to save her, literally. The clock strikes 12, and the game goes offline for good. The next morning, Sui solemnly goes to his part-time job. He notices Rei standing and carrying Wantoi in her arms. She realized that Sui was Jin all along, and she thanks him for helping her all this time. She invites him to play the next game, Grave Buster, with her, and he happily accepts. Suddenly, the handlebars of his bike break, and he wonders how he'll be able to get to his part-time job. Soon after, Yuki's murder is discovered, and Sui runs as fast as he can to the female dorms, but he learns that Rei has already left to make funeral arrangements. Rei mourns the passing of her father at the memorial service, where he is remembered as a jolly man who wanted to make games and spread happiness to all. However, while staring at a photo of Yuki, Sui somehow recognizes him. A few days later, Sui meets with Rei at her father's office. She gives him the parcel that her father left behind, which was addressed to Sui. Inside the box is a sea bay, specifically made for him. Sui finds it strange that he was given something like this, and Rei reveals that she isn't Yuki's biological daughter. Rei leaves to meet a few guests at her doorstep, while Sui finishes the calibration of his sea bay. When it finally loads up, he is in disbelief at the massive inheritance that Yuki has left behind for him, amounting to 10 billion yen. He drops the phone in shock, and an audio recording plays with Yuki's voice, revealing that he is Sui's true grandfather. Yuki explains that he left Sui a large amount of wealth so that he could live a happy life with Rei, but there is another reason. Rei's parents, who were Yuki's partners, were murdered by the enemy, and he adopted Rei to keep her safe. He asks Sui to use these resources to protect Rei at all costs. Outside, debt collectors attempt to bring Rei into custody, but Sui races downstairs and confronts them. Sui tries to rescue Rei, but he is given a public beatdown. Unwilling to see him injured any further, Rei promises to willingly go with them. Sui offers to pay the 500 million yen debt of her father, but unfortunately, the 10 billion yen he has inside Grave Buster is not transferable into real-world currency. So what the hell was Yuki going on about? Rei is taken away, but she is grateful that Sui tried to save her, and she'll never forget him. Sui defiantly hops on his bike and chases down a car going 60 kilometers per hour on the freeway. He reaches out his hand and promises to save Rei one day, and she promises to wait as long as it takes. The debt collectors do a bit of trolling by suddenly hitting the brakes and pulling behind Sui. His bike spirals out of control, and he wipes out. However, a man known as Silicon mysteriously teleports inside the vehicle and rescues Rei. When Sui catches up, Silicon tells him that a man named Temu Jin will be waiting for him inside Grave Buster. A moment later, Silicon disappears. Sui returns home and tries to get his sea bay to work, but to no avail. While trying to process today's events, a woman suddenly pops out of his phone and introduces herself as Twin Star. I had a dream like this once. They are enveloped in a white glow, and they are transported into the sandy dunes of Grave Buster. However, once there, Twin Star transforms into two fluffy creatures. A huge structure bursts out of the sand, and Sui has no time to rest. In the world of Grave Buster, the primordial goddess known as Bango gave life to the universe, ultimately sacrificing her life. Now she slumbers in her eternal tomb, just waiting to be raided. The living tomb tells Sui that he must pass a trial and serve as his tomb guardian, but Sui tries to leave. Suddenly, a large blast of light narrowly misses him and the tomb, 
prompting a raider foe to tell his teammate, Ayu, to adjust his aim by a few centimeters. She then instructs Farin to distract the Living Tomb while Ayu charges up his rifle. The Living Tomb finally convinces Sui to uphold his duty. It shines a bright light towards the sand, which summons Shastia, the desert incarnate. She suddenly kisses Sui, which breaks the seal placed over his memories. He recalls a memory of Yuki giving him a red scarf, which corroborates Yuki's claim that he was his grandfather. Sui and Shastia look at the Living Tomb, and they are surprised to see Yuki emerge from it. Yuki explains that he has many identities, a game developer, the vice president of GGTC, and Ray's affectionate father. But he is, above all, his grandfather. Yuki explains that he is a copy of the real person's consciousness, uploaded into Grey Buster before his untimely death. Meanwhile, the raiders are ready to attack again. Phobe tosses her deck of cards into the air and summons a swarm of giant centipedes. Farin swoops in and unleashes a barrage of PlayStation-themed laser bolts, but her gun quickly runs dry. She is supported by Phobe's centipedes, and together, they descend upon the Tomb Guardian. Sui and the others are forced to run inside the tomb. Yuki leads Sui into the cockpit of the Guardian Giant Yuki 34. Farin finally slices apart the outer shell of the pyramid, but from its ruins emerges a giant Egyptian mecha suit. With lasers, Tomb Raiders and Tomb Guardians have been fighting for a thousand years within the world of Grave Buster. This is just like any other ordinary day. Farin bombards the Guardian Giant from above as Sui and Shastya frantically try to operate it. One of their legs is blown clean off, but Sui finally finds something that will help, a gun. The Guardian Giant draws a gigantic pistol, and Farin is in awe of how massive his gun is. Their oversized pistol fires a laser blast toward Foe and Ayu's hiding spot, but Phobe's card magic reflects the blast, causing the giant guardian to stagger back. Ayu decides to return the favor with a powerful attack of his own, while Phobe pulls another trick up her sleeve. Using this, Shasta falls under the effects of hypnosis after seeing Phobe's cards, and she starts firing uncontrollably into any club suits. While Sui tries to get her under control, centipedes begin breaching the guardian's defenses. However, Yuki's save data begins to disappear. With his last dying megabytes, he tells Sui that he is the last guardian of Grave Buster, and he instructs him to protect Bango's tomb. In doing so, he will indirectly save Rei's life. Sui mourns his death, but Yuki's passing bestows Sui with a mysterious new power. Sui flies out aboard a commandeered centipede and takes to the skies. With the help of Shastya, he vaporized Farin instantly. Reflecting the same beam, he next eliminates Fu. In final act of defiance, Ayu fires his fully charged particle gun. But Sui reflects his attack back, killing him. Later, Shastya congratulates Sui on becoming a fully fledged tomb guardian. However, her role in this stage has come to an end, and she bids him farewell. Suddenly, Sui finds himself face to face with a crazed woman who claims to be the true last guardian. She shot him with the gun while laughing maniacally. Meanwhile, at another place, Rei is washed clean by frolicking mermaids. Later, a large burly man enters Rei's room and she demands to be freed. He holds up her chin and reassures her that, in time, she won't want to leave. As he exits the room, the writing on his back reveals his name, Temujin. Sui awakens in bed, his wounds instantly heals. He then receives a phone call from Temujin, from the group Totems, who invites him to come see him at Grey Busters. He then receives a threatening and incriminating photo of Rei as blackmail. Sui tries to learn more information about Grey Buster, and Rashu introduces him to someone who played during the closed beta testing. Sui later learns that the current top dog of Grave Buster is a man named Dark Tiger, leader of a group named Precious. Precious has been consolidating its power by attacking players and stealing their money. Sui visits Ray's dorm room, but her belongings have been left untouched for days, including a small diddle of his character Jin. Elsewhere, Grave Busters becomes a phenomenal hit, even though it's basically a pay-to-win NFT game. A girl charms her way into the good graces of two men who willingly pay a combined 700,000 in in-game currency for her to join them. In stage 35 of Grave Busters, the newly revived Gold Hunters, now teamed up with a man named Wild Wolf, prepare for another tomb raid. Wild Wolf tries to appease the rest of the Gold Hunters, who have grown impatient with waiting. They finally spot their unsuspecting prey, the three players from earlier. After the three players defeat a few monsters, Foe and Feren successfully charm them away from the other girl. It was incredibly easy given Phobe's advanced charm and Farin's stellar acting. Phobe and Farin lead their three gullible victims into a trap. The girl has to get it through her companion's thick skulls that they were played. Wild Wolf leaps down and nicks a stellar hero's entrance. 
Later, they celebrate another good day of mugging, but they notice a man in distress at the adjacent table. The gold collectors are unsettled to learn that the man was the leader of the generals, a powerful group under Precious, who were slaughtered by a single woman. After spending the last of his money, the man disappears. They return to preying on new players. As advertised, a player's power within the game is directly proportional to how much money they have invested in their character. Wild Wolf, a player worth 50 million yen, stabs one of their unfortunate victims. When your money reaches zero, you die, and your account disappears forever. Suddenly, the prison holding them is shattered by none other than the aforementioned crazed woman from before. She avoids the gold hunter's attempts to fight back, and after feigning surrender, she traps them in an even stronger cage. Wild Wolf fearfully backs away from the woman, promising to hand over every valuable item he has, but it is all a ruse for her to lower her guard. He stabs her with a special sword that absorbs a player's financial power, but it only works if the victim's money is less than the attacker's. Unfortunately for him, the woman is one of the five people in the game with over a hundred million financial power. She decides to show him what true strength is like by dropping a gigantic gold bar from the sky. Phobe demands to know the woman's name, and she introduces herself as the Collector, the self-proclaimed enemy of Tomb Raiders everywhere. Wild Wolf's money drops to zero, and he is killed off. In another place, a young boy named Takeshi dreams of making enough money to leave the slums with an older girl in my can. Takeshi is a man of taste and culture. Takeshi tries to enter a tournament with a real 10 million yen prize, but he is unable to pay the 50,000 yen entry fee. He tries sneaking into the venue instead, but he runs into Sui, who is looking for a person named Lao Long, who is in charge of the beginner's course. Twin Star carries them into the arena, where they are just in time to watch the finals match between Viking and Ayu, both of whom boast to be the best ice users in the world. An exasperated Fu remarks that the only thing Ayu is the best at is bragging. So he asks Takashi who he thinks will win, and he replies, me. His book suddenly shines, causing Twin Star to drop them both. They fall on top of Ayu, killing him. Fo and Furin facepalm. Due to an obscure rule, Sui and Takeshi are recognized as legitimate competitors. Takeshi apologizes for dragging Sui into this mess, but he needs the 10 million yen prize, no matter what. In a flashback, Takeshi and Miken grew up inseparable. I'm not sure if they're actual siblings, but I hope not. After obtaining Seibei's, Takeshi promised to raise enough money to bring them both out of poverty. Takeshi relies on his power, Memory Album, which allows him to store photographs and use them as power. Predictably, most of these photographs are of Miken. When Miken falls terminally ill, Takeshi became desperate, prompting him to enter the King of Iron Fist tournament. Back in the present, he conjures a hammer that fires rockets against Viking, but they are largely ineffective. Takeshi's photographs burn up as a result of him using his power, but he won't need any of them as long as he can save Miken. Takeshi charges into Viking, but Sui grabs his cloak, causing him to trip. Twin Star keeps Viking distracted by doing an impromptu cheer dance, and thankfully, he's too simple-minded to catch on. Sui shows Takeshi that his photo album is now nearly completely empty, which he believes Maikan wouldn't want. Takeshi is still desperate to earn money for her, so Sui offers to take his place in the battle. Lulong announces a change in fighters, but when they display Sui's data on screen, it reveals that he hasn't even completed the beginner's quest yet, so his billion yen status is concealed. An overconfident Viking encases Sui in a prison of ice and prepares to smash him with ice, but Twin Star jumps in to defend him. Twin Star threatens to show them all her beautiful but terrifying form, but she accidentally reverts to her cute and adorable form instead. Viking can't help but smother them with love and care, so Takashi runs in and rescues her. That made no sense at all. Angered Viking starts blasting Takeshi with ice, but Twin Star reverts to her human form. Twin Star transforms into her true jade dragon form, blasts Viking into a jade statue, and shatters him. Sui and Takeshi are declared the winners. Sui allows Takeshi to take the 10 million yen, but he realizes too late that the 10 million was in real life currency. He sadly leaves penniless, but La Long wonders who Sui really is, and if he is somehow connected to the collector. Sui arrives at the beginner's course and meets his fellow initiates, Sha, a jovial, easygoing guy revealed to be his classmate in the real world, and Titan, who is aloof, serious, and no-nonsense. Their instructor, Rin, leads them to a nearby valley to conduct their beginner's exam. Their task is simple, to defeat the tunnel apes that live in the area. Rin instructs them to manifest their busters, their personal weapons that materialize when they first play the game. Titans is a giant gauntlet aptly named Metal Fist, while Shaw's is a large chakram dubbed Storm Eye. Sui is hesitant to reveal his, and he chooses to fight with his fists. 
The tunnel apes are protected by a thick hide, so Rin directs them to attack the chief ape, who is enhancing his brethren's defensive abilities. Titan rushes headfirst and crushes their leader with a single blow. With the tunnel apes' defenses gone, Rin and the others can freely finish off the stragglers. However, there is a twist. Rin tells him their true test is to defeat her. She tosses out three daggers in a cone. Titan deflects it with his familiar Siwi, while Su weaves his head, and Sha is hit. Sha remembers that Sui is poor and offers to sponsor him with his family's money. But Rin points out that a kunai is still in his forehead. She believes Sui is holding back and demands that he show his buster. But he is still reluctant to reveal all his cards. Titan grows impatient, and he attacks Rin unprovoked. Sha finally remembers that Titan is a world-famous virtual fighting game champion, who suddenly disappeared from the scene. The reason is that, after Titan won his third straight tournament, his father immediately presented him with a Seibei as his new frontier to conquer. With these lofty expectations placed on his shoulders, Titan intends not to disappoint. Titan yells at them to help him defeat Rin and Sha, having fallen head over heels for her, reluctantly does so. So he finally uses his buster, the Raven Scarf, and engages its first ability, First Blood, which allows him to steal the ability of Fallen Player. Shaw shows him the power of his Storm Eye, which allows him to become as swift and translucent as the wind. Titan pushes Rin over a cliff, right where Shaw is waiting. However, despite being invisible, he is stabbed from behind. So he rushes to his side, and Shaw's only regret is that he couldn't die on Rin's lap. His one wish is to get her line number one day. He passes away, but he is the most base character here by far. In the real world, Sha excitedly tells his mother that he's finally made a friend. His mom asks him if he's hallucinating. Titan, who fancies himself as the strongest player alive, refuses to lose against someone like Rin. And Sui, now using Sha's ability, tracks down and discovers the true instructor, Theron. When Titan realizes that he was fighting a clone all along, he is furious. Sui praises Farin's decoy mirage ability, since it not only fooled him, but Titan as well. Farin passes them both, and they receive an alley card, which contains all their details and allows them to form teams. Titan, unsatisfied with how things played out, attacks Farin again. Sui rescues her, and they seek shelter in an abandoned building. He makes a deal with Farin. If he can defeat Titan, then she'll team up with him. He'll get to prove it soon, as Titan quickly finds them. Sui makes use of Sha's win techniques but Titan is confident that a loser's ability won't affect him. However, during a brief engagement, Sui gets the better of Titan after fooling him with a leaf clone and landing a scratch on his face and cheek. Sui urges him to surrender, but the word isn't in Titan's vocabulary. During Titan's previous champion ceremony, a few audience members picked a fight with him by calling him a Nepo baby. Titan angrily engages in a fist fight with them, forcing his family to pay the two victims hush money to keep the family's reputation intact. Titan, tired of being told what to do, decides to do whatever he wants. Back in the present, Titan summons the ultimate form of his weapon, the Blade of Tebutan, which looks like the car that beat Lightning McQueen in Cars 3. Titan pours in every last bit of his 100 million yen fortune, and he speeds into Sui, oblivious to the fact that his financial power is in the billions. His car crashes on impact, and after a moment of disbelief, Titan's car implodes like a submarine. The resulting explosion buries Sui and Farin underneath some rubble where he manages to establish a rapport with her, insisting that she join his team. He also manages to learn that she possesses the ability to scan a person's equipment. Suddenly, they were free, when a carriage burst from the ground. It is the same women, Collector. Farin is shocked to see that the Collector has a staggering ten tomb relics, when even a billionaire should only have one. The Collector fires at Farin with a plush round, temporarily turning her into a doll. She then forcibly feeds Sui, a creature that plants itself inside his stomach and explains to him that it holds the key to saving Rei, who is currently held by the totems. She warns him not to trust anything Temujin says, and leaves. Before she disappears into a portal, she fires a gun at Kida, an agent of the totems. Farin returns to normal, and Kida tries to pry information out of him. He hunts him down using Sha's wind powers, and though he believes he has the advantage in speed at first, the truth is, Kida is the faster player. Farin rescues him from being slashed by Kida's blades, but even with the two of them, they are completely at his mercy, and they can do nothing but defend. They notice that there seem to be numbers on their hands, and they discover that, after being hit 33 times, it forces you to log out. Farin and Sui are kicked out of the game, and are unable to log in for a week. Sui receives a call from Temujin, who tells him to listen carefully if he wants to save Rei. Temujin orders Sui to participate at Stage 18's festival, which is meant to kickstart the clearing of Stage 0. 
He is also told to meet with someone named Nishi. Sui recalls his celebrity status as Jin in Dungeon Century, but laments that he is useless now. He reunites with Wan Choi after what feels like forever, and he goes to sleep. The next morning, he notices a commotion out in the courtyard, and he spots a girl being swarmed by a group of men. She turns out to be Farin, and when the guys learn that Sui is somehow involved with her, they start pelting his dorm room with rocks. Sui meets with Farin at the school's cafe, but he is nervous about interacting with someone in real life. A waitress impatiently asks him to order something, as he is holding up a line. Sui has nothing more than spare change in his wallet, but Farin goes and orders nearly everything on the menu, which amounts to 20,000 yen. The waitress asks him to pay immediately, but even he knows he doesn't have that kind of money. A few bullies walk up to Sui and mock him for being poor, but Farin boasts that Sui is a billion player, even if it's just in Great Buster. They tell him to prove it by paying the bill using his in-game currency, which is something he didn't know you could do. The waitress scans his Sibei, which miraculously pays the bills. The three bullies are left speechless. Later, Sui explains to Farin his mission to rescue Rei from within Grave Buster. They log in together and head to the Stage 18 festival. The stage is filled with players, and Farin explains that whenever a stage is cleared, the players rebuild it themselves and transform it into a settlement. Sui seeks Twin Star's help in learning more about totems, but her lack of clothes leads Farin to believe that Sui is actually a deviant. While at a restaurant, Sui overhears players talking about the rumored sixth Phantom Billion player. They suddenly stand up, and he initially believes they're about to try and talk to him, but they go outside and receive transfer rings that will take them to stage 18. They begin to be teleported away, and Sui and Farin follow suit. Sui and Farin arrive at stage 18, the gateway to the fabled stage 0. Tomb beasts emerge from the pillars, catching many of the players off guard. A desperate and all-out brawl occurs, and Sui watches for himself a variety of weapons at the disposal of other players. The stage boss, Aslan the Bloodied, awakens. The various players throw everything they have at Aslan, but his healing skill heals him faster than they can hurt him. Elsewhere, Nishi, one of the players under Temujin, grows impatient with waiting for Sui. She ignores Kida's warnings, and she conjures a mirror that transports her to Sui's. Nishi creates another mirror that allows him to peer into Rei's room. He tries to call out her name, but she has trouble hearing his voice. Nishi dispels the mirror and attacks Sui, intending to put him and his tomb artifact to the test. Meanwhile, Aslan slaughters the under-equipped players sent as cannon fodder. He summons his Mosquito Legion, which transforms their victims into droplets of blood to further amplify his powers. However, he is unsatisfied with this base prey, and he seeks something stronger. He senses that something is above him. Nishi confirms the power of Sui's Raven Scarf, and she relays Temujin's orders for Sui to enter Stage 0. Aslan rides a wave of blood to the top, having been searching for Sui all this time. He bestows Sui with a key that will allow him to enter Stage 0. But before that, he must undergo one final test. Aslan transforms into his ultimate form, the Bloody Buddha, and shows in his weakness, a core in his stomach. Defeating him will also release the seal on some of Sui's memories, another one of Yuki's final acts. However, Nishi suspects the seal contains more than just memories. If that were the case, Yuki would have just told him himself. Sui activates his Regan Scarf, and he draws upon one of its six powers, the Raven Blade. Nishi and Farin flee, and they leave Sui to his fate. With the Raven Blade, Sui's speed has tripled, giving Aslan little time to regenerate. He topples him over the pillar, but when Sui tries to finish the job, a barrier deflects his blade. Sui launches a desperate assault, but Aslan simply grows stronger with every slash, as the pool of blood continuously regenerates and augments his strength. After a single exchange, cracks form on Sui's raven sword, he notices a strange symbol above his head, which Aslan explains is a snow lotus curse. After 80 seconds, the blood inside Sui will explode, killing him. However, if he can steal Aslan's core in time, the curse will be lifted. Sui's sword shatters, but he notices a strange gas emitting from it, and he has a bright idea. The other players also begin feeling energized by the smoke. He goads Aslan into using his ultimate move, and he gladly obliges. While he begins chagrining it, Sui rushes in and slices Aslan from head to toe with his sword. The other plays assist in trying to attack Aslan, but it matters little, as he can freely regenerate himself with their spilled blood. He finally unleashes his ultimate attack, the Crimson Dragon Blast, which wipes out half the battlefield. Aslan prepares to finish the job, but his body begins cracking up, and he explodes from the inside out. Sui now in possession of Aslan's core approaches his mask, the only thing remaining on his body. 
Aslan is unable to regenerate his body, and Sui explains that he used the oxygen produced by his blade to slowly rust the iron present in Aislinn's blood droplets. Since he regenerated himself using the other adventurer's blood, which was also unnaturally rich in oxygen, Aslan also slowly suffered from oxygen poisoning. Aslan admits defeat, and he tells Sui to use his core at stage zero. Sui finds it strange that there aren't any other higher class players here, despite so many being gathered to fight a boss. Now would be the prime time for someone to steal his trophy. The reality is that most of the hundred million players were busy fighting amongst themselves for the right to battle Aslan, and it was pure luck that Sui was able to defeat him first. However, their celebration is short-lived, as a masked group known as the Silverbacks appears. Ryu, one of the heads of the Silverbacks, demands that Sui hand over the core. The Silverbacks are a group of underhanded thugs, whose motto is to log out if things get out of hand, and to always attack in packs. Ryu tries flirting with Nishi before threatening Sui again. Sui entrusts Aslan's mask to Farin, but just as he draws his sword, Ryu fires a blast that misses Sui by inches. They realize that Ryu is enhancing his weapon with his financial power, which he boasts is upwards of 5 million. He has the other silverbacks show off their own asset bars, which all seemingly touch the sky. Sui doesn't like being left out, so he tries it out himself. His asset bar practically shoots up to the moon, publicly revealing him as the sixth billion player. Ryu decides to report this to his boss, but Nishi grows impatient with how things are developing. She uses her magic mirror to punch Ryu as revenge for earlier, and she teleports herself, Sui, and Farin to the gate to stage zero. From this point on, only Sui can enter with the blood key and Aslan, being a stage boss, accompanies him through the portal. Once inside, Sui is hit with a wave of nostalgia, and Aslan instructs him to eat his core. This will release him from his duties as stage boss, and it will undo the seal on Sui's memories. Sui sees a vision of him and his grandpa looking at a tree, which appears to contain a young Rei. Sui learns the truth behind Rei. She possessed a unique power that was absorbed by the red tree using a special ceremony, which will help to defend this tomb. When the process concluded, she was spit out as a normal girl with no recollection of her memories. To protect the power of this tomb, Yuki sealed away Sui's memory as a precaution, and he tasked Aslan with undoing the seal when the time came. With Aslan's mission done, he bestows upon Sui one final parting gift before finally disappearing. Aslan is officially defeated, and every player who participated in the battle receives a cut of the money. Meanwhile, Ryu contacts his boss, who is furious that someone else took his prey. Ryu tells his boss, Joku, about the billion player, and in retaliation, Joku unleashes his ultimate attack, the Artemis Snipe, toward the stage zero gate. An observing player attempts to measure the attack strength, but it destroys his scouter. Sui emerges from the portal and blocks his attack with his bare hands. Farin is shocked to see him still standing, and he explains that Aislinn's equipment gives him HP equivalent to the combined HP of every person in the current stage. When Joku learns that Sui survived his ultimate attack, he is filled with a mix of anger and anticipation. Before Nishi teleports them to her boss, Sui demands to speak with Rei first. She obliges his request, and he allows them to talk. Sui promises to rescue Rei, showing that he now has the power to do so. She says that she'll always be waiting, just like she did in Dungeon Century. Silicon abruptly ends their transmission, and he tells Rei that they'll only free her after Stage Zero opens in five days, provided Sui can survive that long. Sui is tasked with defending Stage Zero to prevent anyone else from entering if he wants to see Rei again. Nishi leads to open a portal to Temujin, but an explosion occurs on the field. Jyoku emerges from the smoke, eager to exact revenge on Sui. He begins killing players indiscriminately, even going so far as to summon a golden monkey spirit, until Sui shows himself. Nishi opens the portal and urges them to leave. Sui initially ignores the massacre happening in front of his eyes, but after thinking of Rei and how highly she thinks of him, he decides to turn back. He plays right into Joku's hands as he prepares a point-blank Artemis snipe. Suddenly, Kida swoops in and messes up Joku's aim, saving Sui and reducing the damage considerably. After healing Sui's wounds, Kida battles Joku. They appear eagerly matched at first, but it is clear the Monkey King has the upper hand. His Tempest Punisher cleaves through the earth, a testament to his overwhelming strength. Kida is forced to retreat, but Joku quickly follows up with a Tempest Arrow, which causes a powerful explosion. Luckily, two officers of Totems, Beck, an Ice Wizard, and Nondead, a tree magic specialist, arrive to their aid. However, even with the addition of two formidable fighters, Joku is unfazed. He boasts that his total assets are nearly a billion, making him one of the most powerful fighters in the game. He activates his Satan ability, 
greatly enhancing his strength, speed, and most importantly, his size. He taunts Sui to show him what he's got. Joku summons the most natural weapon of a monkey, a chain gun. Beck and Nande put up a desperate defense, but it won't be long until the bullets penetrate their combined barriers. They ask Sui if he has any tricks up his sleeve, but he first asks more about Joku. Beck explains that once a player reaches the 1 billion mark, like Joku, it becomes impossible to gain any more assets. The only way to break through this cap is to earn a Lone Star title, which can only be gained through special circumstances or experiences. Sui received his Lone Star Grave Guardian title by inheriting it from the special Seabay. Joku continues pouring on the heat, eager to claim Sui's title for himself. In a flashback, Joku, frustrated over not being able to receive a Lone Star title, challenged Dark Tiger for his. Kida explains that Lone Star titles allow a person to break some of the game's rules. When Joku's bullets stop, Nishi leaves their barrier to investigate. However, Ryu remarks that his boss is merely biding his time. The chain gun has a three-minute cooldown, but once it replenishes itself, its power will be multiplied by six times. Not even a billion player could endure its might. So he doesn't know the full extent of his title, but he does have a plan. Joku's gun recharges and anyway, he starts blasting. Nishi is badly injured and their barrier is destroyed, but Sui activates his eye. Joku believes that he's killed them all, but they've all miraculously survived thanks to Sui's efforts. He explains that his raven scarf allows him to randomly select one of six jewels, each with a specific power. The purple jewel allows him to strengthen any one part of his body. In this case, his eyes to its absolute limit. Now able to bend his shadows and some extent of reality to his will, he was able to freely move everyone to safety. Joku is eager to continue their fight, but Nishi pacifies him by offering a duel with her leader, Temujin. Joku can't resist a chance to not only battle a billion player, but to also become the leader of the totems. Nishi takes them to their base, and Sui prepares to reunite with Rei after what feels like a century.